Have you ever found yourself just moseying along in Red Dead Redemption 2 and found yourself mesmerized by a sunset? Perhaps the way the light is poking out of the clouds in the distance? Or just how thick that fog and snowstorm appear? Or how about those shafts of light peeking through the trees? What is a god ray? That and more on this episode of Tech Focus. <laughs> Getting to the bottom of so-called god rays in games means getting a basic idea of the visual phenomenon that it is. A god ray is basically the effect of light and shadow interacting with participating media. Participating media is just a word for describing diffuse particles of stuff occupying space. It could be water, vapor like fog, dust from a storm, or even smoke following a fire could even be large cloud-like structures or nebulae. You could just also imagine it as being it the air and atmosphere itself. In the real world, the sun or any source of light interacts with these participating media, allowing us to see it as fog, dust, and the like. Lighting is actually hitting that media, going into it, and traveling back into our eyes, allowing it to see the volume that it takes up. It just looks suitably volumetric in the real world. Matter in this form is not solid like a chunk of metal or a piece of stone, so light does just not primarily bounce off of it or reflect off of it in that same way. Light bounces around in the volume of gas, dust, or particles, or water vapor, and even goes through it so you can see through it to the other side. Light even bounces around in and out of it multiple times, giving the lighting that hits it a more diffused and scattered look. This is called multiple scattering. It is made of oh so many incredibly small particles and facet, the nature of which on the microscopic level can have a large effect on its look on the macroscopic level. So participating media is actually tons of tiny facets that can have complex movement as well. The gas can swirl around and move due to outside forces. With that in mind, and if you think about how rendering now is only getting to the point where we can simulate light bouncing around opaque hard surfaces, for example in something like Quake 2 RTX, or with parts of that in other less ray traced games such as Battlefield 5, then it is definitely not realistic or realistically feasible to simulate millions of gaseous particles, their physical movement, and then to trace rays of light bouncing off amongst them or going through them. Really, in spite of the amazing advancements in real-time rendering technology, it's just not possible to simulate so many particles with such realistic lighting at an interactive frame rate. This is true now, and this was especially true in the past. So if ray tracing or path tracing such particles to simulate them is unrealistic, what about the way rendering has been done in games since GPUs or consoles like the N64 came about? That is through rasterization and analytical lighting, as it is called. The problem with this type of rendering is that it is based on opaque hard surfaces primarily. Real-time rendering becomes complex and inordinately expensive in its own right when it has to account for the ability to see through an object, so not just the way the light looks on its surface, but the way it permeates it and leaks through it as a volume. So the way we rendered games traditionally is just not a great fit for semi-transparent, complex volumes. But if that's true, how do developers still manage to capture the look of it in a game at all? I mean, looking at Red Dead Redemption 2 here, that fog looks suitably thick and it looks realistically lit if you ask me. How this media is lit and shadowed or how god rays are done is a question of when a game was developed and what type of volume media we're talking about. Small things like fires or smokes from fire or explosions, rain and the like are typically represented by something called billboard particles, or sprites. These are planes of geometry with a transparent texture on them that typically turn based upon the player camera, so you can never see their side where they would just look like 2D cutouts, which they actually are. Since you're only seeing one side of it, they do look like they're taking up a 3D space to a certain degree. But if you pay attention, or they are on the screen too long, or they take up too much screen space, then the effect breaks down as you can see it kind of moving with you. Video games have even used this method in the past for extremely loud features like clouds in the sky. 
but how particle effects or clouds in the sky or how distant atmosphere are rendered are not the topic of this video per se, even though they are extremely related. Those effects probably deserve their own tech focus at some point. But this usage of transparent geometry was not just used for such effects, it also was a way and still is to represent these god rays. Developers have represented rays of light with transparent geometry since the very inception of real-time 3D graphics, with one of the first areas I remember actually being in Mario 64, around this piano here. Rudimentary for sure, but it gets the idea across of an occluded ray of light coming in and lighting up the dusty air. It's unmistakable in what it's attempting to represent, and within the context of the graphics at hand which all look suitably abstract, it does look like it. But there are problems. Since it is just a piece of geometry just statically placed by an artist, it can actually be misaligned with the real lighting, if there is even lighting at all, which a lot of games in this era actually did not have. So by its nature, it is not dynamic. Also, since it is a transparency, it has typical problems that transparency has, meaning it has sorting problems. Sorting is a common problem in rasterization, where various transparencies that are overlapped may render in an order where they do not necessarily additively or multiplicatively shade in the right manner. So a transparency behind another transparency can look awkwardly placed at the wrong depth, as its color does not reflect the transparency in front of it. This is a common problem. Nonetheless, transparent geometry or transparent geometry with a texture is so ubiquitous and computationally uncomplex that it is still used in games till this very day. It found its way into graphically complex games like Killzone 2, Crisis, and even incredibly modern games like Battlefield 5, where the texture is applied to geometry in a well-arted way and it even fades in and out. This gives the appearance that the shadow is perhaps moving. And to prevent it looking obviously fake if you were to walk up to it, the transparent geometry fades out the closer you get. It's a tried and true way to represent the air itself being lit and god rays pouring in, but it's wholly static. Next to this type of representation of god rays, another related way to represent this type of diffuse lit volume emerged in the mid-90s as well, through something called fog volumes. These basically utilize the fact that rasterized graphics have depth in a 2.5 dimension, so to speak, and increasing or decreasing the visibility based upon depth gives the look of fog. So you can get that look of light passing through the thin medium of air. By utilizing this and varying its color based upon parameters such as height, or by localizing it to tiny volumes in the world, it can kind of look like atmosphere or fog. I think one of the best examples of this type of fog to represent volumetric lighting is found in Unreal from 1998, where local fog volumes are placed in corridors to simulate the look of dense air being lit by lights. This is simply achieved by varying the density based upon depth away from the camera and having the fog be the same color as the lighting in that area. So when it strobes in sync with said world lighting, it looks pretty convincing for the time or they used it by placing the fog volumes around specific geometry or light sources to make it look like there's local lighting, as seen here. But really, they're not tied together in any physicalized manner. It's an illusion, but it communicates the idea of a volume being lit. These two methods were the bread and butter for games up until around 2005, I would say, as multiple technological strains converged, giving birth to new ways to render this type of god ray phenomenon. As of 2005, GPUs had gotten powerful enough and programmatically capable enough to now draw lighting and shadowing in real time through the use of either shadow maps or more commonly at the time, stencil shadow volumes, which were just all the rage in 2004 and 2005, with Doom 3, Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay, and Fear famously utilizing them exclusively. Now that lighting and shadowing were done in real time, and much of the gameplay was being based around it, those older static style of effects would not necessarily hold up as lighting and shadowing were moving so visibly. But there's a plus side here. Now that we had shadow and light tied together dynamically, that information was available to draw upon as a resource. Thus, ray-marched volumetric lighting was born either leveraging shadow maps from this real-time lighting or those oh-so-popular shadow volumes. This works in general, so to speak, by rendering from the perspective of the light source as an origin. 
And from here, you can call upon the information from the shadow map by marching array through a number of steps where it samples at each point whether or not it's occluded. This is then brought back to the player camera perspective after blending and filtering it to look suitably like a medium of particulate matter that has been lit. This can also be done as a post-process where a transparent quad is rendered in front of the camera view and ray marching is done from the camera perspective into the opaque depth for each pixel to find the distance to an opaque surface while sampling the shadow map for the light source along the way and then integrating them all into the main view frame buffer again as a colored blend based upon some principle how light scatters through media, such as Beer's Law. Here the shadow map sampling and the darkening of the light color is what gives us the impression of a god ray. The first game that I know that used a version of Ray March volumetric lighting would be 2005's Fear, First Encounter Assault Recon. Alongside the aforementioned stencil shadow volumes, Fear had the occasionally placed light source, directional or from a spotlight, that had ray-marched volumetrics, thus giving the appearance of dusty air where shadows pierce through it, that god ray appearance that we've all come to know and love at this point. But it sure was expensive to do this, so optimizations were made, either by reducing the resolution of that initial ray march out so that it's not per pixel, but perhaps every fourth pixel or even less. It can also be optimized by reducing the amount of steps that are ray-marched through and sampled. With a lower initial resolution, the fuzzier and more diffuse the effect looks, but it can still hold up, as fear really shows. This looks pretty good still. Almost at the same time though, you historically have the release of something like Perfect Dark Zero, which just came out one month later almost, and uses a form of ray-marched volumetric lighting as well, in a post-process manner, coming from the sun as a directional light source. Here though, another type of optimization was used where the amount of steps in the ray-marching was reduced. It was still done per pixel, which is why it looks so sharp, the problem then occurs when the camera moves. That low amount of steps in the ray marching causes the lighting and shadowing to distort, giving the appearance that the world's lighting is not stable in the medium of air, even though it is actually extremely stable if you look at opaque surfaces. Beyond this nascent time in 2005 when usage was sparse or perhaps overly optimized so it didn't look perfect, it found its way into many landmark titles and defined them in many ways, such as the original Crisis. The effect here in Crisis was found in surprisingly high resolution for 2007 and defined many sections of that game, such as the core, as Nomad unwittingly reaches the alien mothership. These ray-marched lights here with their dancing shadows set the mood perfectly. You also have games like Metro 2033 from 2010, where the initial PC release used ray-marched volumetric lighting so extensively and to such a high quality that the later Redux edition actually ended up cutting its usage to keep up the frame rate on lower end machines. Due to the expense of ray-marched volumetric lighting and other limitations I will talk about shortly, it never actually became the de facto replacement for just popping in a transparent textured billboard in front of a light, which is still found in countless titles up to this day, even in Battlefield 5. But ray-marched lighting in this manner from specific lights like the moon or sun, or for many lights even with greater optimizations, was found in many titles, such as Rise Son of Rome, or in Lords of the Fallen and Killzone Shadowfall, which used these ray march volumetric lights from so many lights by leveraging a number of optimizations developed in the intervening years from 2005 to 2014. By reducing their sampling rate and managing their resolution well, they could be used in a greater number, as Killzone Shadowfall definitely shows off. Still, problems remain with this way of emulating lighting like this. Since ray-marched volumetric lighting is not integrated in a holistic way with other transparency effects, it can have transparency sorting problems, like I mentioned earlier. Likewise, it's actually just emulating the effect of light on a medium itself, but not doing it in a holistic way where there's an actually a medium, a thing itself, being lit. It's just the outward appearance of that set up on a light-by-light -light basis fully up to an artist. So the way air density or fog density is communicated through these lights is more or less arbitrary and not actually tied to the environment the light may find itself in. And lastly, it is still actually pretty expensive to do as each light requires its own ray marching in a scene. 
That is all up until 2014, when a bombshell of sorts hit that changed the face of volumetric rendering to what we know today, basically. In the next generation and PC port for Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag, an interesting type of rendering was put forward. Inspired by light propagation volumes, whose implementation found its form into Crisis 2 and 3 on PC, this game utilized a projected 3D texture in front of the camera, a frustum-aligned voxel grid, for example, as was described in a later paper by Sebastian Haller. Here, a 3D texture is projected in front of the camera, with a progressively lower resolution of cascades, or voxel blocks, for example, the farther it goes out, and then it terminates. This projected 3D grid in front of the camera can then coincide with local or global fog volumes, where it becomes possible to inject the real-world lighting and shadowing information from the entire scene of lights and shadows into this grid. Then by utilizing ideas of how light scatters or falls off or propagates in a medium, this is shaded. This is done by ray marching just one time instead of individually for each light like the previous method. So for more or less one of the first times in video game rendering history, there is a representation of a diffuse volume like fog and it is indeed the thing being lit and shadowed. So we are basically at the point of simulating volumetric lighting instead of just emulating the appearance of that effect through singular ray marching or by more primitively placing a billboard particle to make it look that way. With this technique, any and every light is essentially volumetric, as long as there's a volume of fog, for example, for it to light up. Fog which is either artist placed, such as around the knees of characters to create an atmospheric mood, or can be done more globally or based upon a programmatic mean, such as adhering to valleys or based upon the height of terrain. This technique from 2014 and advancements on it from them is the reason why so many areas of Red Red Redemption 2 looked so right. Although this is a massive step forward for volumetric lighting and making god rays look great, it's not the end all and be all, or a silver bullet for this type of phenomenon. As mentioned, that projection in front of the camera is cascaded and terminates. It only reaches out so far. So any more global effect that takes place beyond this projection, like massive distant rays between clouds, could not be simulated with this technique, as they would just be too far out. So there's examples like Rage 2 here, where you can see the exact point of cutoff from that projection in front of the camera. But there are things being done to solve that problem, and Red Dead Redemption 2 does it in a really interesting way. Beyond that 2.5D projection in front of the camera, normal ray marching, as I described earlier, is done. And to keep that ray marching beyond the 2.5D projection cheap, it doesn't include every single light, those fog volumes, or any contribution from GI, rather just the directional sunlight in this game. For this reason, Red Dead Redemption 2 can have volumetric lighting close to the camera from every single light source, but also maintain those macro effects in the distance, for most things at least. Going from Super Mario 64 all the way to Red Dead Redemption 2 sure does show the massive increases in realism and dynamism in representing god rays in video games, volumetric lighting. But even then, as Red Dead Redemption 2 shows, there's still no silver bullet to doing this type of lighting at all scales, yet. And until that magical solution is found, I know I will be furiously examining every light source in a video game for years until that comes along. And now that I've covered volumetric lighting, I definitely want to cover other related topics such as sky and cloud rendering, and particle rendering and lighting itself. But until those videos come out, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy it, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, then please consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you can remember a game before Fear that used ray-marched volumetrics, or you can think of some other technique that was slighted or needed more coverage in this video, then just write a comment to me below, or follow me and Digital Foundry on Twitter. And as always, this is Alex, bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen!